they don't want to treat people like family and they refuse to acknowledge the fact that they're family because we're so different because we have that one bit of black blood you know that makes us black Oh yeah, was his special person that he loved and and taught him uh, about world events and got him interested in reading newspapers early on, and um, yeah, she was a very and handed him a rifle that his grandfather had used <coughs> way back and a musket loaded rifle which I still have. Yes, yes, right. yes. So. Um, his his brother also told me that his uh, his grandmother looked white, and he said one day a white insurance man came by and said to his grandmother, uh, "Are you the only white family in this nigga neighborhood?" And said, she looked at him and said, don't you ever say that to me again. I am not white. I am black. And this is not a nigger neighborhood. This is a black neighborhood. <laughs> so, <laughs> Good for her. Lucky that he Yeah, he's lucky he didn't get shot. I remember reading uh, 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 some report when... Uh, one of Robert's aunts was visited by the FBI and he wrote that she was more, um, she was worse than Robert. After, <laughs> <laughs> after Robert had left Monroe, she said, well, this is a no good town and she, he should have burned the damn town down. <laughs> that was his, his uh, one of the direct uh, descendants of this grandmother, uh, her daughter, who oh made that. Aunt Cora, she was really a wonderful person too. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he he got it. he had a tradition of struggle and of anger at the society for refusing to recognize people as people. And and I think that's that's um, Robert didn't like to talk about it. His older brother John would talk about it, but Robert. Uh, didn't like to talk about the co that connection, so he he wouldn't talk about it very much, but uh, his older brother would. <laughs> um, Only why not? I told him that he was he wanted to deny that portion of his that German stubborn portion of his heritage and he would only claim the black portion <laughs> because because they denied him I think that's the reason why and he 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 didn't like that part of it but it you know that's a reality that we face that is a reality when if you start to go back and research and find that um I don't remember which president said it was the most inhumane form of slavery he had ever seen because people were selling their own sons and daughters into slavery. And the South knew that they were doing that. They knew that they, they knew, and they have never faced up to that fact. They have never faced up. Monroe has never faced up to yeah, the everybody fact. Everybody Yes. You have to have a humane society because we're all kin. Yes. Of course, in the South, we treat our kids <laughs> yes. well. Yes, yes, yes. So, <laughs> I mean, that's, you're not Southern mm -hmm. if you don't. That's right. I mean, Come on. I mean, we have homecomings. We have reunions. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Family, we, yeah. families first. Yeah. I, uh, what, one of the presidents now, one of the old presidents, they have found that Jefferson. Uh, it's Jefferson that has these two, um, Descendants that they did the DNA and found out, oh yeah, but they said they still won't allow them to be a part of the home place. They can come to the family reunion, but they still. So it's not just a Monroe thing. Apparently, they're starting to look at Washington now. Yes. Now they can do this DNA. <laughs> yes. Some questions about George Washington as well. Yes, yes, yes. 
Uh, so <laughs> no surprise. <laughs> no surprise. No surprise. So, um, but that does not negate the fact that there, has, there still has to be ongoing struggle. There still has to be ongoing struggle in order to overcome all of the evils of the past. And I think because our capitalist society at this stage is so, we have so engaged all of our people, black and white and all, into materialism that it is becoming more and more difficult to have any meaningful human struggles, social struggles that tie people together, that tie people together. And um, it gets back to those people who have opted for the good, teaching their own, their young people, that we have something beyond stuff and things. There's something important in this world that is more important than gathering up toys and stuff and things and there's a human element out here that we need to be concerned with and um, I'm hopeful that that is going to happen I'm hopeful that it's going to happen Yes. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> but I'm. Well, I had grown up in Monroe, and I mean, I can see. You know, I mean, one. Uh, you know, I'm not going to say you wouldn't have got where you are without a certain almost innate hope. Yes. 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 Grounded not in like exactly what's what in front of your eyes. Uh huh. Uh huh. I mean, a, a further vision or something. Yes, and and and. Uh, one of the things for me personally is that I think this whole experience of my life has taught me that where we are in the world today, there is no set solution out there. That the, there's no ism that's going to do it. It is not coming out of... Um, any political, specific political force at, that's out there right now is something that's going to come out of something that we don't even have control over. But we know that once we identify with it, that it's going to come. And I think it has to do with spiritual. We're in a kind of a spiritual warfare, and I think that... Uh, that's where the solution is coming from. I'm wondering if, if our country, our beloved country at this time, is on the edge of uh, the Roman, where the Roman Empire was before it went plum plummeting down. A lot of people don't like to think about that, you know. But uh, everything lives, everything born lives and dies, right? And we would be blind if we didn't know that societies do the same thing. But then we have to have a belief and a hope that a society will be developed that can be better. We haven't seen the best of what this society has to offer, what this world... I hope not. I'm sure, I'm sure not. We haven't seen the best. Yeah. I do feel, so. you feel like, uh, like, especially like with the Mm -hmm. Yes. All of a sudden, you know, we can't, uh, you know, it's like, okay, we're here. Yes. And all of a sudden, everyone's starting to look inward, like you said. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Both mm -hmm. kind of at a national level. Yeah. And personal. Mm -hmm. And like, well, all those years we were, you know, like our reason to be, our national reason to be was to beat the Soviets. Yes. And now we have this huge empire. Mm-hmm. 
Right. And we look in, and we look at like, well, what we're about. Yeah. And there's not much there. Not much there. Uh, All they're doing are grasping and grasping and grasping and, and, and grasping. And, and people look at like these school killings and things. And yeah. Oh. Yeah. So Terrible like wrong. And at a, at a real uh, deep place. Mm-hmm. No. But but people are wondering. Yes. Looking around. Mm Mm-hmm. And people have to, like I said, they have to make a choice. You know, do they want to be a part of the mean-spirited evil forces that are going on? Or do they want to be a part of the solution? You know, it's like the civil rights song. Which side are you on? Which side are you on? Hey, come on. You want to take a little break? Yes, please. Um, when was the first moment when we've talked about this what Monroe was like yes and we've talked about the way that black people were, were kept in their place mm-hmm. um, what were the first signs the first time that there were chinks in the wall of the system that the when, when, when was the first time that you saw a black person stand up to Monroe? Stand up and not end up in jail. Or right, worse. right, right. Hmm. Was Robert the first, or, or were there things before Robert that you remember? I was trying to think if there were any incidents before Robert. Robert was such a major part of my life that sure. it's, it's very difficult to think of yeah. life before Robert. Sure. But, um, you were just a young mm, Right, right. <laughs> um, nothing comes to mind right away. Okay. Um, I remember after Robert and I got married um, and one thing that brought the realization to me that there were this you know I was in a different situation was uh, Robert was writing letters to the editor and um, I don't remember what the first letters were about but I remember Robert's father and my and well first of all Robert's father telling me, in front of Robert said, "You know that man thinks he ought to be president. He he ought to be president of the United States. That he should be president of the United States." And uh, he was talking about his son Robert, you know. And Robert chimed up and said, "Well, why shouldn't I be? I'm a man just like they are, you know." So yeah, I think I'm I'm good enough to be president of the United States. Well, <coughs> yeah, that was that was something. My father called me one day and said, uh, when we were visiting, he said, you, tell, you need to tell Robert to stop calling these people billy goats. And I said, what are you talking about? Somebody had told him that Robert wrote in the paper that these Monroe white folks were billy goats. And I, was, I couldn't understand what it was he was talking about. He said, they are bigots. <laughs> you know, but my father was really afraid that Rob, he said, that boy's going to get in serious trouble calling these folks Billy Goats and going on, you know, <laughs> which <clears throat> Billy Goat was a an apt term for uh, because they like were, it. yeah, <laughs> so, um, but um, his rejection of the way people were treating him and his coming home and talking about it because he was out there trying to get employment, trying to get his GI Bill thing together, trying, and he was running into all kinds of problems and he would come home and talk about it and tell me what was going on, you know, and the things that he had faced during the day. Uh, whether it be at the uh, veterans' place where they were try- he was trying to get his um, veterans allotment for, I think they call it a 52, 20 or something like that. You get $20 for 52 or 56 weeks, something like that, 56, 20. And um, 
So he'd come home and tell, tell us about the problems that he was encountering. But in the meantime, he was still writing letters to the editor and uh, complaining about just simple things, uh, stories that he would read in the newspaper of something happening and uh, just complaining in general about the plight of black folks. What, what did he, uh, what did Robert look like? What did he did look he, like? <laughs> that's a hard question to ask. Oh, uh, yes. In, in 19, this is like 55, 56. Mm -hmm. so. he, he was a very handsome, tall, dashing young man. <laughs> To me, he was very handsome, and he was um, a little bit older than you. Yes, he was. In fact, he was uh, what seven years older than me. <clears throat> he and my sister and his best buddy were all classmates. Uh, my sister was seven years older than me. Um, there was a my brother between my sister and me. The brother that I told you died of tuberculosis, and. Um, but my sister and I were great friends, even though she was seven years older than I. And uh, I uh, spent lots of time at her place. So that's how Robert and I got together. She had married Robert's best friend, who was uh, Kenneth Redford. And, and so uh, when Robert came home from the military and he was there in and out a lot and I was there in and out a lot that's how we got together yeah <laughs> and, and how, how did he bury himself at that time in his life I mean, that, because there's more than looks right yes yes that, yes what, what was his physical presence um, he, he, he was just um, he was just an outstanding he stood out in a crowd uh, he was very proud and self-assured, you know, and uh, muscular. The pictures you can see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would some people call him haughty? You know, kind of crossed the line? Or no, I don't think anybody called him haughty, but he was a little standoffish because he... <clears throat> He rejected a lot of the social norms that even the black people had, especially black uh, middle class people who thought that they're, because they had an education, that they were a little better than some of the regular working people. And he took pride in um, debating them and pulling them down and letting them, you know, Letting them know that, well, you know, if you didn't have your degree, you couldn't prove to me that you, <laughs> right. Right. you know, that you had one. If you didn't show it to me, right. there's no way I would know it from your intellect, you know. But uh, he was not haughty. He was not haughty. But he was bashful. Robert was, and, and people find that hard to believe, he was very shy, shy, kind of, you know. He didn't shy... He wasn't shy in um, <clears throat> I don't know, he was just shy. <laughs> I, I, I don't know how to describe that. Um, he gave the presence of being very uh, strong. But he was more, I guess, more of an introvert. He was a private person. He didn't, he didn't um, easily mix into a crowd. He wasn't a loud person. He wasn't a social mixer, so to speak. I've, I've wondered about that because <clears throat> the, the whole like the poetry thing, mm -hmm. you know, is considered so. I mean, not not to us now, but maybe for you and me. But in the sense yeah. of the day. Even now in society, that you know, someone who writes poetry right. is usually the most masculine. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I thought that a certain inwardness yes, right, yes. might be there. Yeah, yeah. 
he was he was very private in a, in in a way in his own way he was a very private person and uh, really shied away from a lot of social interaction um, loved classical music listened to it all the time when he was writing or even he reading or studying yeah yeah and um, well he loved all kinds of music but but that was uh, <clears throat> He would listen to classical music when he was real young, um, and during the first years of our marriage, he was that way. He was very much family oriented. He was very close to his family, uh, but um, he was not a social, real, real sociable person at the time when we first married. Uh, <clears throat> he was not a very sports-minded person, so he did not engage in sports. I guess he, he, he was a self-entertaining person, um, more intellectual than physical. Um, he liked to go hang out with the boys and... Uh, talk uh, at the barber shop at uh, like yeah little places like that mm-hmm mm -hmm. get together with his friends and uh, he seems uh, to have almost like a philosophical bit that mm-hmm mm-hmm I think so. I think so. I think he started developing his philosophical outlook very early, well before I knew him. And um, <clears throat> kind of, I guess, measured everything in the uh, from that point of view. What you know, the philosophy that he had already developed in his own mind. Um, Oh yes, <laughs> handsome, good-looking, sweet, loving. Um, oh yes, I fell madly in love with him, and um, of course, my mother was terribly upset, and my father too, because I was a high school student and they wanted me to finish college, finish school and go to college. My sister had finished Spelman College and uh, was already out and had a job teaching. Um, and so that was supposed to be my next move. I was supposed to follow in her footsteps, you know, and do that. But when I fell in love with Robert, that was out the window for it wasn't a while. <clears throat> No, no, they didn't have anything against him personally, except that she, they thought he was too old for me, and that they uh, didn't want, uh, they felt like I was throwing my life away to give up everything for him, you know, and uh, eventually quit school and got married, and well, I did go back, and he was, he always encouraged me to continue my education uh, he l used to laugh about the fact he'd say I raised Mabel you know and uh, his uncle Charlie was had been a school a teacher and it seems that uncle Charlie had uh, married one of his students and also sent her back to school to finish her education after they got married so he'd tell me about that lady you know uh, <laughs> this, this is an unfair question. Yeah. But, um, uh, what do you think that twenty-three or four-year-old Robert Williams saw in you? 
I really don't know, and I can't answer that question except that, except that um, in later... I'm a 16 year old you, I mean. Right, right. In later years, I, um, when we would talk and I'd look at, at some of the uh, developments that had gone on before and think about his girlfriends that he had had before, I think at 20, what was it, 23, 21, I think he was ready to choose a wife. I really do. And I think that he was attracted to me biologically as well as, yeah. And um, I was a little wild. Uh, that's the way he, he described me as wild. I didn't describe myself as wild. Uh, but he described me as a little wild because I walked, always did walk fast. And uh, uh, very outgoing. Loved basketball, played basketball all the time. Got in a lot of trouble because I played basketball. We didn't have a gym. We had to walk all the way to Camp Sutton from here. Camp Sutton is down about two or three miles uh, outside of Monroe. That's where the uh, Army camp used to be. And we'd walk there to go practice basketball and then have to walk back to Newtown and then back on to our house. It seemed like six or seven miles. I'm told now that it's only maybe about four miles, but walking four miles a day was, um, but that was after walking to school and having uh, school all day. And then leaving there and going to, uh, out to practice basketball and then walk back this way and back home. So usually I'd leave home uh, early in the morning to go to school and when I'd get home it'd be after dark in the evening, you know. Oh, she didn't like that at all, and she really get on me about that. Did you play on the team? Oh yeah, I played on the team. In fact, uh, Robert's brother was our uh, assistant coach for a while. His older brother, the one that I told you is eighty. John. Yeah, John. Um, he had come home from the army, and uh, he worked with us as assistant coach for our girl, girls and the boys team. Yeah, we used to travel all around Concord, Waysburg, playing, and uh, I was one of the star forwards on the right. team. Yeah, yeah. Enjoyed that tremendously. And even after we got married for a while, I, I went back and played basketball when I was back in school. Robert didn't like that so well. He, oh, you don't need a married woman, don't need to be out there playing basketball. But uh, finally I had to give that up. But, <laughs> uh, yeah, that was... That was I was really a uh, all out athlete athletic person and I loved school. I loved my teachers and I loved the subjects and uh, I was a good student as well. Uh, I think maybe <clears throat> Robert might have he didn't know a lot about me, but in our conversations, I think he might have seen some potential that. I didn't even see in myself at the time. So that's the best I can answer that question. And you saw it in him. Yes, yes, yes. And he was a great teacher. Eventually, he was a great teacher. Of course, we had our problems like any young couple will have. And, um, and especially the fact that here I am, a um, person who was... Um, trying to accommodate the status quo. And here was this man that I had married who was always out there questioning the status quo and protesting against it and not being able to conform the way I could conform. I could accept it and walk away. I could walk away from the... Um, conditions like in the basement of that hospital. I could walk away and accept the fact that I was given a job and that I was allowed to learn some things on that job that would, you know, be helpful to me. But I could walk away from that 
and walk into another job that was just as segregated, but maybe would give me a little bit more uh, money and a little bit more opportunity. And knowing that this is, uh, it's a job, it's a way of living. I, I can help, I can help support the family. But he was not able to do that. And especially when he was in a position where he had gotten a job. For instance, they were building this highway down here. <clears throat> he and some of his friends got a job on the highway. The white man was a foreman and he couldn't read and write. And all of those fellows had been had finished high school and some had been to the army and some of them had even had some college training. And they had these minimum wage jobs and the foreman was a white man who could not read and write. And Robert, that was something he couldn't accept. He just could not accept. Early on, he started having migraine headaches from the pressure of the things that he saw in the society that were so wrong. And, and when he tried to... <clears throat> he became the enemy rather than the situation being the enemy you know and that created a lot of friction with me and him as well as in the society because I at that time could not accept a lot of that either you know well you know everybody all of the black people have to make accommodations with in order to make a living you got to make accommodations and he would make accommodations for as long as he could but he couldn't keep his mouth shut about it he would uh, say okay I got this job wonderful I got this job that's wonderful but the first time he encountered uh, a situation he didn't hide his talents under the bushel if he saw somebody who was supposed to be his superior and that superior asked him a question, he let it be known right away that he knew more about it than the superior did and that got him in trouble a lot of times. You know, because a lot of times you have to hee hee, ha ha, yeah, yeah in order to keep a job. Black folks have been uh, traditionally good with that. But he was not he was not good at that, you know. <clears throat> I could hear jokes about black people and say, yeah, ha ha, and walk away. But if he heard a joke about a black person that was a derogatory joke, he would not feel the same. And his reactions were different from mine. And not only that, but he did not stop writing in the paper <coughs> letters to the editor in his poetry and having it published while he was still working on these jobs. And if uh, <clears throat> an employer found out that he was one of these what they call smarter uppity niggas that was writing in the paper, they'd fire him just for that. Sure. You know? So <clears throat> sometimes I, would, I was in the position of being a part of the problem for him because I was trying to get him to conform and he was trying to get me to see that we should not conform. So those those were some of the things that caused friction in our sure. our relationships. Especially once you have some children. Yes, yes, yes. Especially then, yeah. And um, he was very, uh, he was a good daddy good father. He uh, taught the boys a lot and they um, they learned a lot. They learned a lot from him. Mm -hmm. This was the first time that uh, Robert went beyond in Monroe. It was mm -hmm. the first time he went beyond the letter writing or, or standing up to maybe one person mm -hmm. like the, on, on the job. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, that came when he became president of the NAACP. Uh, I think that must have been around 56, sometime when all of the local 
professional people were experiencing a lot of problems if they belonged to the NAACP or the white folks thought they belonged to the NAACP. There was um, uh, a lot of economic pressures that were coming down. Teachers, um, just all of those people, the, the local white power structure was letting it be known that they were not going to tolerate having their Negroes being part of that, what they call that communist-backed NAACP. And so the professional people, and they, they were most of the people who belonged, black people, uh, who start, uh, when Robert came back from the army and he was elected, he, uh, he went into the NAACP thinking that this is the organization now that's going to help to bring about all these changes, you know, and, and uh, uh, the Supreme Court has made the decision and now everything's going to be just fine. And uh, he went into the NAACP with that in mind. And most of those folks just either left or when they joined, they told they would join under an, uh, pseudonym, uh, an anonymous name and don't tell anybody that I belong, even a, a mother who was a teacher and her daughter was a teacher. The mother didn't know that the daughter was a member and the daughter didn't know that the mother was a member because they were afraid of the economic pressure, you know. And uh, I remember one uh, one black guy who was a janitor in uh, at one of the local places and I don't remember what the place was but he said that uh, and he had been a member of the NAACP for a long time and uh, uh, he was sweeping around and, and uh, they were having a meeting or he was in the room somehow and he said he heard this uh, one of the fellows said I wouldn't have one of those nigga NAACP people working for me and he had never spoken up, had had the job for 20 or 30 years, had never said anything. And he said, he threw his broom down and said, well, God damn it, you got one now. <laughs> and he came and told Robert about it. And Robert said, no, 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 no. That was the wrong thing for you to do. And he said, Robert, I couldn't help it. I just was fed up. That was it. That was it. And after that, I just couldn't help it. I just couldn't help it. He got fired, you know. And I don't, I don't remember what happened after then. But every time Robert would in, um, enroll somebody else in the NAACP, he would warn them, don't tell anybody that you belong, especially the people that you work for. You know, you can tell your other friends, but don't tell the people that you work for that you join. It's all these people. Leave. Yeah. And Roberts left. With hardly anybody, and he just went and recruited among just ordinary common folks on the street. He went, he's, he likes to tell, liked to tell the fact that his first members came from the pool room. He went into a pool hall. And his mother had been a very deeply religious woman and uh, had warned them. She was always afraid that her children would turn out to be gamblers or drunkards. And she would warn them to stay out of the pool hall because they gamble in the pool halls. And so Robert didn't even play pool, you know. He didn't play any kind of cards. And uh, he, didn't, he didn't hang around the pool halls and places, but he said that he was passing one one day, and he said, well, I wonder if I can maybe get these fellas to join. He went in there and started talking to them. He said and he wrote up his first members on the pool table. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, after that, ACP, that's yeah. right, that's right. And I think that may have been um, a part of the militancy of that. Not only did he write up uh, regular people, street people, he wrote up maids and cooks. And so we knew what was going on in a lot of the houses of the white power structure because they had maids and cooks in there who were in members of the NAACP. they come back and tell us. I remember one particular incident where Robert was going on trial for something. I don't know if that was the sit-in case or what it was, but uh, the maid for the judge said that the judge came in that morning at breakfast and he said, Oh, honey, to his wife, honey, I'm going to be a big man today. 
and and she said, "Why? What? What's going to happen?" Said, "I'm going to send that nigger Robert Williams to prison." And she came back and told us about what he had said. Now he had made his decision, and the court hadn't even started, but he knew he was going to send Robert. To, he was going to convict him already, you know. So. <laughs> Um, so you guess this NAACP with the, with the ordinary people, mm -hmm. and what, what happens then? Well, um, then they started, uh, he was really the, he was the leader, and they tell him, you do what you have to do. So he would go to different places in the name of the NACP and try to get jobs for people, you know, get them to hire. I remember a place, Allen Overall, boy, he worked, they worked on Allen Overall for years to try to get them to hire black people, and he even wrote to Washington in the name of the NAACP because Allen Overall had a contract with the government, and he found out all this stuff, you know, that they had this contract, and they weren't hiring black people and all, and that's when they had what they call a trickle-down thing. They said, well, the city council said that, uh, well, if we, um, if they hire the white people, then the white people will hire the black folks as maids and cooks, and then, uh, <laughs> then they will, they will, yeah, yeah, and then they will, that's you know, right. no, that's fine, then they will benefit from it, you know, from that standpoint, so. Um, I don't remember when it was that, whether it was before the NACP or after the NACP that we had the, uh, Rob had joined the Civic League, which was also um, an organization that at that time was working with the city council. They had a Negro Civic League that would... Uh, well, at, at first, it was supposed to be a civic league that was made up of all members of the community, black and white. And uh, But actually, what they would do is when they got ready to have meetings, they would call uh, in these members of the civic league, and most of them were what we called Uncle Tom. And they would go along with everything that the, the city fathers would propose like the trickle-down stuff, and not protest anything. Well, once Rob joined that Civic League, uh, it almost, I don't remember if it tore up or what happened, but they stopped calling on the Civic League so much. But I think that was his introduction to the Unitarian Universalist Church. It was a Unitarian church at that time, and the local white, uh, one of the local white uh, People was Ray Shute, who was the head of the Unitarian Church, and he was um, had been in real estate, and he was one of the city fathers, uh, but he was a liberal, white liberal. In fact, he used to say, I remember hearing him say, well, I'm really a socialist by philosophy, but until such time as all of the capitalists give up their money. I'm going to keep my money. <laughs> I'm going to keep my money to protect my, to protect myself. Right. And so we'd laugh about that, you know. But um, <clears throat> we would visit them on a social basis, and he and Robert would just sit and talk for hours and hours. Sounds very unusual. Yeah, it was very unusual in this. For that day. Yeah, for that day. And... Um, <clears throat> Finally, he invited us to become members of the Unitarian Church. And before then, Robert would go to the Unitarian <coughs> Church, and uh, he, they invited him there. Uh, Ray did. Ray Shute invited him there to speak on two or three occasions, and he'd go and speak. And uh, then he invited him to become a member. <coughs> well, then when... Robert accepted and decided to join. I never will forget uh, uh, Ray Shue told us that there was a judge, Judge Williams. Now everybody in town knew that Judge was a 
Judge Wiggins was an alcoholic. But every Monday morning, he was sending black men to prison for being drunk. Okay? Uh, Judge Williams um, made the remark, according to, it was either Ray or some of the other Unitarians who told us that, he said he'd be damned if he was going to belong to a church where they had a nigger. So he resigned when they accepted Rob into the Unitarian Fellowship. It was not a church, it was a fellowship. But we used to go over there and we'd have fun around the pool and sit and talk and have uh, potluck after church services. <clears throat> well, while Robert was getting involved with the Unitarians, I was getting involved with the Catholics. Yeah. So uh, Rob also had another great friend who was Father Thomas McAvoy. He was a Catholic priest who had come to Monroe and established the first Catholic church. Father Thomas A. McAvoy and Father Mac was our friend. We were friends with Father Mac until his death. He died in after we came back from overseas. But we maintained contact with him all those years. He remained our friend. While Robert and uh, he was a friend of Dr. Perry's, who was also Catholic, and um, he headed up the, um, we had segregation in Catholic Church at that time. Uh, there was Our Lady of Lords, which is the Catholic Church here now, and I still call it the White Catholic Church. And then there was St. Joseph's Mission, which was a church that I joined and I took my two boys in, and even though Rob and Father Mac were great friends, he never joined the Catholic Church. Rob didn't. He joined the Unitarian Church. And, uh, but the boys and I became Catholic. And um, not only did I join the church, but I was very active in our little mission and worked for the mission for a long time. I worked first as uh, doing their um, yeah, uh, rummage sale in the community, and, uh, and another time we established a daycare for working mothers, and I took care of kids in the community, St. Joseph's um, Daycare Center. So um, all of this was going on almost simultaneously, and I was learning from Father McAvoy, and at a later time, Father John Garone came in. He was also a very progressive priest. And, um, but I was taking part in the Unitarian Fellowship and learning a lot there, too. So a whole lot of this was a process of education for me, dealing with people on an intellectual level that I had never dealt with before. Uh, dealing with uh, ideas that I had never encountered before, um, seeing the respect that they had uh, for Robert and his ideas and the respect that Robert had for them and their ideas and how they exchanged, you know, it was a great, it was a great university for me. Yeah, sure. And, uh, <clears throat> better, than, better than a real university. Yes, yes. And it also was helpful in um, with dealing with the children and trying to instill some values in them, you know. So, uh, but the Unitarian Church also uh, that experience uh, started to uh, people the the when the people found out that Robert was associated with the Unitarian Church. That brought on a lot of other <coughs> kinds of, uh, well, you know, we don't want to have nothing to do with this nigga, you know. Um, <coughs> Mr. Shute tried as best he could to help Robert get established in a good paying job two or three different times. Uh, one time he got a really good job. They were going to make him this. Oh, they were going to, oh, this new factory moving in because all these factories were moving in from the north and uh, they were going to make him a uh, dye man in the an industry down in 
it was outside of Waysboro, in Anson County somewhere, but <clears throat> the city fathers got to them and they got rid of Rob in a, they, at first they started, well, the, the man who was supposed to teach him was a German and he was, of course, secretive about his dyes and so forth, but he was willing at first to teach Rob. But then when the city fathers got involved, all of a sudden, only thing Rob could do was empty the garbage. And it kept going like that. And Robert kept saying, well, you know, when are we, when are we going to get into the techniques of, you know, the dying and so forth. And they just kept pushing him down and pushing him out and further and further and further away. And it ended up that he was driving all that long distance for to be a janitor. So that didn't work out. I don't, I, I don't think we found out about what the city fathers had done until he got his uh, uh, files from the Freedom of Information. And then we found out that, you know, they had a lot to do with uh, undermining our economic situation. But we had lots of uh, support from local people, farmers, who uh, would give us corn and stuff out of their gardens. Black we, farmers. Mm -hmm, black farmers. We never did have a... Uh, uh, we didn't starve to death. People would come and give us, bring us stuff. They go shopping and bring stuff to help us out as well. And one thing that I point out to a lot of uh, young black women today, when I'm talking to them about the situation, they talk about. We talk about uh, male chauvinism and all that. And but one of the tools that uh, this system has always used, and they used in Monroe, I could always get a job. They'd always open up and let me work. But, and I didn't always understand why I could get a job and he couldn't get a job, you know? Or I could get a job and keep it and he couldn't get a job and keep it. I didn't always understand that. I understand the techniques, the tactics now, how that undermines the unity of the family because he's supposed to be the head of the family. The husband is supposed to be the head of the family traditionally to support his family but it undermines his manhood when he can't when he can't do that it undermines his manhood and so uh, that also creates a lot of problems created a lot of problems for us but not you know so um, the whole time we were here until we got totally involved in civil rights, I was able to maintain a job. Uh, I worked at the um, Union Memorial Hospital once that hospital was established. I worked at the uh, turkey plant. <sighs> turkey plant. Yeah, it, uh, I think we got 50 cents an hour. We were, you know, and standing in water all day, cleaning turkeys. Uh, but it was a job, and uh, I was able to maintain that for at least for a while when they had turkeys coming in and so forth. So, um, all of that had its impact on what was going on, and, and Robert, seeing all of these uh, things that were happening and wanting to make a difference and make a change, and so... The kissing case had a lot of momentum to it. 
uh, and you know help to help to move it along. But I, I'm trying to remember, and I'm not very good at chronological uh, dates uh-huh. and 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 the sequences because uh, now that I look back over it, it just kind of melts together. But so. I remember Rob going to Cuba, and um, he went along with several black writers and artists, Leroy Jones and uh, uh, some of the other artists. And um, while down there, learning about what was going on with the Cuban Revolution. But then we had already started publishing The Crusader before then. So I'm trying to remember. I don't remember if we were publishing The Crusader when the kissing case came along. I think we must have been because we had good mailing lists that we were able to contact people all over. Um, um, the newspaper stopped publishing Rob's letters to the editor. I'm surprised they ever did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But... Uh, they did, but the the closer he came to identifying problems that were existing in our community, the more they uh, the newspaper decided that no, we don't want to let this, we don't want to publish this. So after he got to be the president of NAACP, and he tried on several occasions to report things, incidents that were being reported to the NAACP and all that, and the paper wouldn't run anything. They wouldn't tell what was going on. And so uh, he, they came up with the idea that we'd need to have our own press, something that we can, so that we can tell the people what's going on. So that's how we... Um, decided we'd better put out a little newsletter. And he said, well, we'll just make it a one-pager, a two-pager, you know. And um, once we started doing that, and I guess if I would go back and read some of the earlier editions, I would see exactly why it was that we came up with that and what the sequence of events were. But uh, perhaps you can do that. At well, some later date. Well, Tim was actually reading to me from last night, from the first edition. Oh, really? <laughs> okay, all right. One of the interesting stories that I, yeah. that I liked in it was that um, uh, you had a piece on a, uh, a, an elderly neighbor. Mama Stitt. That's right. Yes, yes. And that was the very first, it was a two-part thing. Oh, okay, the, right. The first part was mm-hmm. in, I think you, your son John came home, yes. you and he wrote, uh-huh. and said that Miss uh-huh. was telling stories about slavery. Yes, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and, and you have basically an oral history like we're doing right. today. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. The yes, so I, okay. I like that. That's wonderful. I'm happy to hear that because that had totally slipped my mind, but yes. And she was a very interesting lady and she told us all kinds of stories about uh, how what had happened to her during slavery. And um, there was another lady also who lived between us and Miss Stitt. Miss Stitt lives on the corner, and we live down the middle of the block. But there was another lady, Mrs. Olorati, who also told us about things that had happened to her right after slavery and what had happened to her family during slavery. So uh, we did get uh, ben- have the benefit of that oral history from those two neighbors. And well, what was your role in the well, I, I, yeah, go right ahead. No, no, just go ahead. I, uh, besides writing a column, uh, I had to um, do the corrections, the English, and all of that on Robert's work, the editing of his work, and um, type up the because we put it out on a mimeograph machine, you know. I had to type up the stencils and uh, then help to run them off. And and, uh, so I was just a big part of it. Robert was mainly the 
uh, he was the brains and the and the uh, editor, and I was a uh, proofreader and uh, mechanics person to well, do. You were a writer too. Yeah. 